It's good to be back with you. We're going to dive right back into our series on Jesus' kingdom parables. This should fold somewhat into the larger emphasis that the church has on the kingdom, life in the kingdom. So we're looking at the parables of Jesus about the kingdom and what they reveal to us about this amazing plan that God has for his world and his intention is for his kingdom to include the entire world. Thank you guys for that reminder and uh, to include us in that plan. So in the last session, we did sort of a flyover on parables as a kind of way of communicating to the average person. And I'm going to assume that you have this information under your belt as we move forward into these, these uh, next five sessions on Jesus' parables on the kingdom. Uh, if you need to go back and review, that's all online, and you're welcome to go back and review that. Um, and if, if, if you haven't seen it yet, if you missed uh, last week's uh, session, then you can uh, watch that for the first time. So today, though, tonight we're going to be looking at the parable of the mustard seed. And you go, well, okay, it's a one-sentence parable. How complex can that be, all right? But as we know, as we saw last week, as you've seen before, Jesus' words, teachings are incredibly textured language and culture and uh, the world of Judaism and Jewish practice and um, the, the realities of his world, all of that it just creates such a depth of texture that we're actually going to have to go phrase by phrase through this one sentence uh, parable of Jesus. First thing we want to do is to get on the playing board. Remember we talked about the playing board last time? God's revelation comes in time and space. It's not disembodied. Uh, it's not theoretical. It's very much connected to boots on the ground, nuts and bolts, the reality, where the rubber meets the road. And so we hear in the Gospel of Matthew that in chapter 13 that on that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. That puts this whole chapter and all kinds of parables that Jesus is going to tell in Matthew chapter 13 within time and space. It's, this happens in a real situation. It's not something that is philosophical or speculative or theoretical. And it came about when Jesus had finished these parables, we hear almost at the end of the chapter, that he departed from there, meaning that he was at the Sea of Galilee and now he leaves the Sea of Galilee. It says he came to his own hometown, which you know of as Nazareth, and he begins teaching there in the synagogue. So let's get on the playing board. What I did was I turned upside down uh, a satellite map that I shared with you last time. So now we're looking, and I think that you can see this week my cursor, we're looking at the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and we're looking south in this direction, okay? So north, south, east, this way, west, that way. And we're going to focus on this area right here. It's the, the town of Capernaum. It's where Jesus had moved from Nazareth 20 miles to the Sea of Galilee, another five miles to Capernaum uh, to make his home base here for his three and a half year uh, ministry. Here's a picture of the Sea of Galilee and that's the reason I turned the, 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 um, uh, the satellite upside down so that you could see from the same perspective that you're looking now. This is looking from the north shore all the way to the end of the Sea of Galilee, which is this is the southern shore. This is the east and the beginning of what we call the Golan Heights. And this is the west in the direction of Magdala and places where we visited last time. Right in front of us is the north shore and just off the screen to the right is the town of Capernaum. Here's Capernaum and the excavation. This is the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is the modern church that's built over top of several ancient churches. 
that go back to the 4th and 5th centuries uh, A.D. Here's the monastery for the Franciscan monks uh, who administrate this property. All the way to the right-hand side is the plain of Gennesaret. This area right here is where Magdala is. Mount Arbel, you remember from last week? And to our left off the screen is the uh, town of Beth, uh, Bethsaida. Uh, play, the home of Peter and Andrew originally and Philip and Nathaniel. So we're now uh, rotating around to the east of Capernaum, looking up the shoreline. Here again is the modern church, the spaceship looking building built over top of ancient churches, we'll, which we'll look at uh, in a moment. And you can notice the, the distance from this church to the shore. You can basically throw a rock from one uh, to the other if you've got a good throwing arm. Here's the synagogue from the 4th, 5th century with the foundation, which is probably 1st century. This is the, uh, a pretty rare picture of those ancient churches. You can see they're octagonally or stop sign shaped. And uh, this is the uh, the youngest of the churches. This is a, an older church by about 100 years. And then there is a uh, a room that is right in the middle that's been cleared off. This is a part of a larger house called an insula home that housed about 120 to 130 people at the height of occupation. This area in the middle has been, been cleaned out and was uh, plastered on the walls and on the floor. And there were uh, uh, inscriptions in both Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic uh, to Jesus as Lord, mentions of Peter by name, um, first century fish hooks and oil lamps and coins that were found right here in this room. But all of the other, other than the oil lamps, all the other domestic vessels and what have you had been removed. And this had been... Um, uh, consecrated as and used as a chapel, probably the first church in the world that goes back to the days of the apostles. And this was probably venerated because it was Jesus' own private room, his own living room slash bedroom. So from there, we think of Jesus living in Capernaum, teaching there at the seaside that day, before eventually leaving at the end of the chapter to go to his hometown of Nazareth. And Jesus, throughout this chapter, is going to talk about a sower went out to sow. And there were certain kinds of soil. And he tells a, another parable about wheat and tares. He tells other parable, another parable about mustard seed. And so in this rural area, in this agrarian community, he's talking largely about farming. He's talking about uh, uh, all kinds of realities of nature, different types of uh, plants that are growing in that area. So this just happens to be a field full of mustard seed. So the yellow that you get when you squirt the mustard bottle, well, that's probably some kind of yellow dye number uh, 15 or something like that. But the reality of it is that the buds on mustard plants then turn into a seed and then give us mustard. Jesus, in his parable in chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew, it says he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So this is what the, the subject of our discussion of our uh, teaching tonight. Which a man took and sowed in his field... This is the smaller, is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it's full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Pretty simple and straightforward, right? Not know, knowing Jesus, probably not. And especially because we're removed in terms of you know, 5,000 miles in terms of 2,000 years, in terms of we live in a secular slash Christian society. Jesus is living in a Jewish society. He knows his Bible 
the old, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible by heart, as do most of his hearers. We're living in a different world. We're like ships passing in the night. And so it's important for us to take this parable um, and to break it down into its component parts. So the first part of the parable, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. I want to talk to you just a little bit about two aspects of this business of kingdom of heaven. First of all, when we get to the parallel passages, and there are parallels to this in Mark's gospel as well as Luke's gospel. So we have three shots at this in our Bible, three different versions or accounts. And listen to the way that Mark and Luke introduce this parable. It just says in the gospel of Matthew that he taught a parable. Mark goes a little bit deeper than this. How do we picture the kingdom of God? Remember, I said last week that Jesus' parables function like this, as do the other over 2,000 rabbinic parables or parables from the early rabbis from just before, during, and after the time of Jesus that parables are snapshots of everyday life. They're stereotypical pictures that everybody can relate to. Everybody knows about a man who had two sons and one was obedient and, 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 and faithful and the other went off the rails. We, they know about this kind of situation. Everybody knows about, has walked along the, the path and watched a, a, a farmer sowing his seed, broadcasting as we say. These have to be something that everyone, regardless of age or educational level or occupation or gender, is going to be able to get on board with. That's the way parable functions, and it functions like an illustration. It illustrates with an earthly reality. It illustrates a spiritual or heavenly reality. It's looking at the concrete and being able to connect more closely to something that can't be seen, that's not quite as concrete. So Mark says, how do we picture the kingdom of, listen to this, God, kingdom of heaven in Matthew, kingdom of God in Mark, Luke the same. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like, that language of comparison, and to what shall I compare it? So the first thing that I wanted to share with you about this business of kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, is, is there a difference? I have people almost every place that I go to teach, to preach, ask me what the difference is between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Did you just notice that Matthew uses the phrase, king, the kingdom in literal Greek and Hebrew is the kingdom of the heavens? And in parallel position in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, they're using the phrase kingdom of God. So it's pretty obvious from that and lots of other examples that these two phrases are synonymous. They mean the same thing. There is no difference between the kingdom of the heavens and the kingdom of God. Why then would the gospel of Matthew 32 times, and that's the only place we find it in the New Testament, use this phrase, the kingdom of the heavens? Because that's probably literally word for word what Jesus originally said in his context. The idea had come, up, come about in the second century B.C., so it's been around for 200 years by the time Jesus is ministering, that it's a really bad thing to take God's name in vain. And by that, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Ten Commandments, and in Jesus' world, they did not mean you're not supposed to curse. You're not supposed to cuss. It means that you are, have to be really careful about the way that you connect in some oath formula. I promise that I'm going to pay you back by Sunday or whatever. You've got to be really careful about connecting God's name and therefore his reputation with that. And so the eventually the society culture developed to the point that they were trying to avoid saying God's name at all 
whether in an oath formula or any other kind of way. So they would call him the Holy One or the Blessed or the name, Hashem, the name, as you get in the book of Acts, that they considered themselves, that they were rejoicing because they'd been considered worthy to, dis, uh, to suffer dishonor for the name. And so this is what's going on here with this business of heaven. In this situation, Matthew is recording the literal, it's almost like a, like a video. It's like a tape recording the very words of Jesus because in his culture, you did everything that you could to avoid saying kingdom of God. Well, why does then Mark and Luke use it? Because Mark and Luke are both writing in context outside the land of Israel. Mark in Rome, Luke in Asia Minor, Greek and Roman versus Jewish. And those kinds of concerns were not on the table in the world that they were communicating to. And in fact, it was easier for their audience to understand, okay, when you say kingdom of heaven, you're really meaning kingdom of God. So the two are interchangeable indeed. This business of the two being completely different and either representing um, some, ki some kind of the spiritual realm versus the earthly reign of God, Spir heavenly reign of God versus earthly reign of God, uh, or another way of, uh, that, that has been uh, attempted to put overlay onto this kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God is that one means that which has already been fulfilled and the other is that which has not yet been fulfilled. Neither one of those definitions will work because they're in parallel position and because the two in Jesus' world functionally meant the same thing. Does that make sense? Here's hoping. There's a second thing that I want to talk to you about as far as this phrase kingdom of God or the kingdom of the heavens as Matthew has 32 times. Kingdom of God is um, used 68 times in the Bible. 32 of those are by the gospel of, uh, or by the writer Luke. So kingdom of heaven, uh, different kingdom programs are also in play. We tend to think, well, back in Jesus' day, all Jews believed X, Y, or Z. All Jews practiced X, Y, or Z. All Jews were hoping X, Y, or Z. Nothing can be further from the truth. You think about it for just a minute. Human beings are just really diverse. If we're anything, we're different, right? Different attitudes, different priorities, uh, different skills, different giftings. We're just a, we're a whole planet full of, you know, almost 9 billion different kinds of people. And that's the way that it was in Jesus' day too. Now, everybody was not marking and walking in lockstep, marching to the beat of the same drummer. So there are different kingdom programs, different definitions of what comprised, what was this kingdom of the heavens or kingdom of God. So let's just look at some of these. You read about these guys in the, in the gospels, the chief priests, the Sadducees. What was their attitude about kingdom? Well, we hear about it in early literature, not so much in the Bible. We don't get these guys parsed out, carefully defined in our Bible, but in ancient time, people knew, they knew all about who these guys were. Example, the priest of the second temple, the rabbis say, all of this is the early rabbinic stuff, stuff that the early rabbis have repeated by word of mouth. Eventually, it's written down, and this is the teaching of the early rabbis from before, during, and just after the time of Jesus. Why did those priests of the second temple, the Ezra, Nehemiah, Jesus, Herod, the great temple, why did they go into exile? Because they loved money and they hated one another. We get it in another text. The priests who served in the second temple, they loved wealth and they were hating each other for no reason. We get it in yet another one. The second temple was destroyed because they bought the high priesthood with money. And this is not just something that later rabbis began to say or whatever. This is from a text from the second century B.C. called Second Maccabees, written around 105 B.C., almost 150 years before Jesus began his ministry, records exactly the same thing. The purchase of the high priesthood, first from Greeks and then from Romans, for money. So these guys were all about building their kingdom in terms of monetary um, uh, wealth, in terms of physical assets. They were all about building their own personal kingdoms. 
in the city of Jerusalem, going up the western hill from the Temple Mount, we find that these guys are living in palatial estates that, and get this, this is back in the ancient times. This is not in modern day. They got, these guys were living in um, palatial villas that have more than 6,000 square feet. Even their basements are tiled with little tiny differently colored rock called mosaic floors. They, only, they have their own ritual immersion pools in their basements. They're able, they're so wealthy, they're so rich that they're able to import wine in glass vases from Italy. They are able to afford stoneware, which is incredibly expensive. All kinds of jewelry and, and incredible furniture, furniture made of stone. These guys live opulently, and their cash cow is the temple. Think of Jesus cleansing the temple, driving out the money changers, turning over the tables of people that are buying and selling. Um, these guys are, are the fat cats of their world. They have struck it rich, and the kingdom that they're building is their own kingdom, and it's a kingdom that is existing in the here and now, and that's it. That's one way of building kingdom. I guess in a way, though, we don't have to worry about that today because nobody does that. They don't live like that anymore. It's, it's, it's totally academic. It's totally irrelevant to us today. But at least you know that there were people back in the day who were thus minded. Jesus won't truck with any of that. that that's not the way, that's not his kingdom program. There were another a group of guys and these guys were on like the opposite end from the Sadducees uh, chief priests, high priests. These were the, guy, the people who were pro-revolutionary. They thought that they had it so bad that, they, you, that the only way that our situation can get better is to kick the rotten Romans out and um, basically self-rule, rule, our, rule ourselves. These guys are called in the Bible and elsewhere, they're called the revolutionaries, they're called thieves, uh, they're, they're called bandits, they're called zealots. And here we read a, a passage in Josephus, the first century Jewish historian. We read him last week as well. He says, Quirinius was dispatched by Caesar. We read about that in Luke chapter 2, this guy Quirinius, to make an assessment of their property. This first century historian says that Judas enlisted the aid of a Pharisee named Sadok and threw himself into the cause of rebellion. They said that taxation, this is the census that Joseph and Mary are leaving Nazareth and traveling to Bethlehem to enroll in this taxation or census, carried with it a, a, a status that amounted to downright slavery and they appealed to the nation to make a bid for independence and that heaven would be their zealous helper. Remember we said already that the word heaven, hashamayim, is sometimes used to refer to God. So this is basically saying that God would help. If they just get the thing kick-started, God would jump in and would take care of the fact that the Romans grossly overwhelmed them in terms of numbers and um, military equipment and training. Um, but that God is going to jump in and he's going to be the great equalizer. All they had to do is get the party started. So their kingdom program was a matter of self-assertion. Self-assertion, Let, let's force our own will onto another group of people and let's do it by the force of arms and we can bring in the kingdom of God slash kingdom of heaven, they mean the same thing, by the force of arms. So there's another kingdom program. Then there is the movement called, the, uh, called Pharisaism, the Pharisaic movement. And the leadership of the Pharisaic movement are the ancient rabbis. They're the intelligentsia or the leaders of the Pharisaic movement. What do they have? What, it, what's their attitude about kingdom building? What's their kingdom program? In one of the earliest rabbinic texts that we have, we read, one first has to accept upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The yoke of the kingdom of heaven. You never hear kingdom of God in the rabbis because 
their stuff is Hebrew and it's land of Israel and it's Jewish, so they're not going to use that phrase that we get in Matthew and in Luke, kingdom of God. They're using this way of getting around referring directly to God by uh, using the phrase the kingdom of the heavens. And by the way, yes, Jesus' language, the kingdom of the heavens is exactly grammatically in every way exactly the same phrase that these early rabbis are using. So you, you, you accept on yourself the yoke of the kingdom. You become the slave, the servant, and God is the master, the yoke of the kingdom of hev heaven. And then you accept upon yourself the yoke of the commandments. So there's a connection between accepting God's rule and submitting to his lordship to his word to his commands does that make sense all right let's look at it in another way rabbi judah said at the time the israelites stood at sinai everyone uh, all agreed with one accord to receive with joy the yoke of the kingdom of heaven They're just like a an animal one that is plowing the yoke that you receive, that some master behind you is telling you the direction to go. You receive the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. By the way, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's using the same kind of language. You would expect that, wouldn't you? He's having to communicate to the same population, the same kind of people as the rabbis. So the language is much the same. The yoke of the kingdom of heaven as it is said, now how do you receive the yoke of the kingdom? The quote is from Exodus chapter 19. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So there's this an, an, a close connection again with submitting to the kingdom of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God in your life, and listening to and obeying what that God says. You see the connection? This is, it's not difficult. Let's try it um, one more way. Let's look at Jesus' version of the kingdom. Jesus' kingdom program. Remember we looked at already, we looked at what the Sadducee priests, their kingdom program. Then we looked now at what the, uh, what the zealots said and then what the Pharisees said. Here's a question for you, and a pop quiz is coming. You can feel it, can't you? Which version... Which of these versions of kingdom program does Jesus tap into? What does he look, which one does he look the most like? Jesus said, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane at his arrest. He says, put your sword back in its place. Those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. How would a zealot read that? Well, I guess that does me in. I have to put my sword back on safety. Or don't you think that I could appeal to my father and he would at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? This is not about um, flexing. My sword's bigger than your sword. Who he who gets there with the fastest, uh, the, with the mostest. It's, this is not about self-assertion. If it was about self-assertion, we wouldn't have a Garden of Gethsemane arrest. We wouldn't have a imprisonment. We wouldn't have a scourging. We wouldn't have a crucifixion. You say, well, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, no, but then we wouldn't have a resurrection either. You got to do the math. You got to look at the end game. So Jesus is going, no, nah, it's not, not by self-assertion. He also says, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. Then in the, in the garden, his prayer is along these lines. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, and yet not my will. It's not about my self-assertion. It's not about me building my kingdom right here with the 6,000 square foot mansions and the tiled basement floors, the private baths and all of the Roman glass and uh, the uh, cups and saucers and uh, serving trays and furniture being made of pure, of solid stone. It's not my will. It's yours be done not about kingdom building here it's not about self-assertion instead when he's teaching his disciples and this is the lord's prayer the uh, the ideal prayer the prayer is our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name and then the next thing is may your kingdom come 
taking the yoke of the kingdom. Your will be done, accepting the responsibility for obeying God, conforming our will to his nature and his word. Your kingdom come and your will be done here like it is there in heaven. That's the way of the kingdom in Jesus' words. That's the way of the kingdom in Jesus' life too, as we saw in the garden. So when he says the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about God's rule in our individual lives and nothing less than that. Us submitting to the will of the great king. Us conforming our priorities and our agendas and our lifestyles and what have you to the nature and character of God and his word, the kingdom of heaven. So the next little chunk that we're going to look at is like, is like. I'm going to do this quickly. It's the language of comparison. He presented another parable. This is the introduction to this parable of the the, the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like, but we saw already that in the gospel of Mark, it's how do we picture it and by what parable do we represent it? Do we present it and it's like. Luke's even better. What's the kingdom of God like and what do I compare it to? So when we're talking parable, we're talking about the, the language of comparison. Is that the case with the rabbis? Absolutely it is. They're telling parables to the tune of over 2,000. Here we have in one early rabbinic text, the quote is Proverbs chapter 8. I, wisdom, which their understanding is meaning the Torah, the, the law, was raised with him, a source of delight to him every day. Now they gave a parable. To what can this be compared? Does that sound like the language of Jesus in the Gospels? Absolutely it does. You give a Bible verse or some kind of spiritual reality and then you give a parable and you say, what can be this be compared to? What is this like? Oh, and by the way, to someone who took a piece of wood and carved lots of figures on it. So this is an earthly example of a spiritual reality, something that everybody knows about. By the way, carpenters do this kind of work. Here's another text from the rabbis, and this is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. The Lord your God is a devouring fire, a jealous God. Okay, well, how exactly do I get my head around that? How do I inculcate? How do I absorb that spiritual reality? Well, Rabban Gamaliel, and by the way, Gamaliel, this is Paul's teacher, is mentioned in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 22. He gets two mentions in the Um, in the New Testament. So Robin Gamliel, Paul's teacher, said, I will relate a parable to you. To what is this matter to be compared? Do you see the language of comparison? It may be compared to a king of flesh and blood who had one son. Does this sound like the language of the New Testament? Of Jesus in the New Testament? He's the only one in the New Testament who tells parables. Yes, absolutely. It's functioning exactly the same way. I told you we would be experiencing this as we delve deeper into the subject last week when we did our flyover. Now you're starting to put some, some meat on those bones of last week. To what, is, what can this be compared to a king of flesh and blood who had one son, right? Okay, so I can relate to that. Another one. Numbers 20 and Psalm 32. This is a comparison of Moses and David, both in the situations in which they sinned, really let God down. Because Moses, you did not sanctify me before the people when you struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And then let my, David says, let my disgrace not be written in Psalm 32 in terms of his sin with Bathsheba. The rabbis say a parable with with regard to Moses and David to show what this may be compared. Again, the language of comparison. It may be compared to two women who were flogged in the court for their sins. One a a great sin, one a, a, a lesser sin. Language of comparison. Here's another one. All all the stuff is from the early rabbis. He sent darkness and he made it dark. What in the world is that all about? How do I relate to that? How do I apply that to my life? Psalm 105. To what may this be compared? Well, it might be compared to a king whose slave rebelled against him, etc., etc. 
If you want to read any more of these, like the rest of the parable, how the parable ends, feel free to go here. Uh, you can download this to your phone. You can have walk around uh, Fort Myers with all of early rabbinic literature in Hebrew and Aramaic and also in English translation by simply downloading this app. Isn't that amazing? We never had access like we've got today. So the reason that I, another reason I suggest this, not only can you do it, but you can check, you can do your homework. You can read the rest of that parable. I cut it short for purposes of time and space. Um, but you can also check my homework. You can check the teacher. And um, that's totally appropriate. We fact check politicians. We ought to be fact checking people that are speaking directly into our spiritual lives. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, and this is smaller than all of the other seeds. We're going on to the next little chunk of the parable. Smaller than all of the other seeds. Well, in early rabbinic literature, we're hearing that the daughters of Israel were so stringent, so careful about themselves to the extent that if they saw a spot of blood, and this has to do with ritual impurity, the size of a mustard seed, then they would sit seven days before waiting to immerse and then become ritually pure again. The size of a mustard seed. Sounds like he's they're referring to something very small, right? Okay, and the reason why I put all of those references there, you can take a picture of this or you can go back and watch it. The point is this stuff is all over the place in early rabbinic literature. It's not hidden in a corner, so it wasn't hard to find. Rabban Shimon ben, Ga ben Gamaliel, this is Simon, the son of Gamaliel, who was a contemporary of Paul and probably a schoolmate of Paul's, explains, there is no limit to the size of the stain that she has found as, as she is impure, even if it's as small as a mustard seed. Do you hear the language? Something tiny. Another text, a man's emission imparts impurity in any amount, even to the size of a mustard seed. Again, some kind of a very small amount, small in size. It was taught by the earliest rabbis, one may move a mustard seed, and that's even on the Sabbath when work is forbidden. You can't carry a burden because a mustard seed is so small. Again, safaria.org, great source of information in Hebrew, Aramaic, and in English. I think they're still waiting on the other holy language, Espanol, um, but um, yeah, it's, it'll be worth the wait. Jesus uses this language exactly the same way, and it's not just in Matthew 13, Matthew 17. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, he's talking about something that's really small, something tiny, I decided I'd do my own little research or little experiment on this. So I went out on my back deck one day when uh, th there was good sunlight and I put a penny in my hand and then I put four BBs and then I put four mustard seeds. See what I'm talking about? Something that is so infinitesimally small that you can hardly see it. And Jesus says, but when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plants and it becomes a tree. Well, here's a great passage from rabbinic literature. It once happened in a village called Shechin, and you've got to be careful the way you pronounce that, ladies and gentlemen, that one stalk of a mustard uh, plant had three leaves. So they took one leaf and they were able to cover a potter's hut, make a, a, a roof kind of shingle his roof with one leaf from a mustard uh, plant. Here's another example. Rabbi Halafta said, I once had a stem of mustard plant on my property and I was able to climb up it the way that one climbs a fig tree. In other words, it's just like a normal tree. I can climb jack and the beanstalk, okay? Okay, the, maybe these are a little bit um, of an exaggeration, but that's the point that these rabbis are trying to make is that these mustard plants have the capacity to become even trees with tree trunks. So Jesus is not missing something. 
He's not miscommunicating. He didn't misspeak here. His contemporaries are using the same kind of language to refer to the same kind of reality. Let's take, for example, some pictures that I've culled over the years. Here's a guy who's over six feet tall, and he's standing in front of a stand of mustard plants and reaching as high as he can, but I've marked this because I knew it would be difficult to see with lighting, etc. This is as high as those mustard plants are growing. It's like double the size of a man. So this is 12, 13 feet high. Here's another example. That's not totally exceptional. This is the top of that plant. This is a person who's over six feet tall. So we're talking about little tiny seeds that can produce gigantic growth, right? So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now we've already talked about Jesus borrowing from the language of comparison and uh, mustard seed specifically and that his contemporaries are, they're, they're talking about how small it is and yet how big it can become, that kind of thing. But let's take a look at another source that Jesus pulls from. He has to talk the language of the rabbis. It's the language of everyday life. It's the language of the common man or woman on the street, right? So it's his contemporaries, the everyday kind of language and figures of speech and imagery that people are so familiar with. But there's another source that Jesus has access to, and that's a gigantic chunk of material called the Bible, his Bible, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. Look at what Ezekiel says. He's talking about God restoring the nation of Israel, bringing them back out of captivity and creating a huge nation out of them yet again. And he talks about Israel being placed on the mountains and it's going to bring forth branches and bear fruit. It's going to become stately like a cedar, okay, like a big tree. Does that sound a little bit like mustard seed? Does that sound like Jesus? And in the birds of the air and every kind will make their nest under it. That's exactly what Jesus has said. Make their nest under it and they will nest in the shade of his branches. Small seed, big plant, and the birds of the air make their nest therein. Notice that this is about kingdom. And Jesus is talking about what? Kingdom. Here's another example. Ezekiel again. Think about it. This is 600 years before Jesus began to minister and tell parables. That, that's longer than from where we are back to the Protestant Reformation. That's longer than we are back to the days in the 1600s, early 1600s when the King James Bible was first translated, 1611. I mean, this is a long time, and yet Jesus is borrowing from this kind of language. Watch what he says in e Ezekiel chap chapter 31. This is about the kingdom of Assyria. It's loftier than all the trees and it has lots of branches and branches that are long and all the birds of the heavens nested in its branches. Same kind of language. We got it in Ezekiel 17. Now we're getting into Ezekiel 31 and this is the kind of language that Jesus is reaching over 600 years back into the past and pulling this kind of language into his parable. Do you think that maybe he knew the prophets? You think maybe his listeners knew the prophets? Oh, yeah. Here's another one. Daniel chapter 4. And Daniel is talking about the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom. The tree grew large, its height to the sky. Birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. This is the kingdom of mankind whose branches the birds of the sky lodged in. So we've got Ezekiel, we've got Daniel, we've got at least three examples. That's all the time that I've got. But Jesus is borrowing from his Bible and he's including that language. The birds of the air make their nests in its branches and he's incorporating that into his parable. Here's a rule of Bible interpretation called the rule of immediate context, the immediate literary context. Right after Jesus tells the parable about the mustard seed, he tells another parable. It's kind of like, okay, guys, if you were dozing off right now, I'm going to tell you another parable, and I'm going to underline this spiritual truth. Again, he said, meaning I'm going to address the same thing yet again. 
to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? I'm using Luke's version. That's why we've got kingdom of God, not kingdom of the heavens. It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Little tiny chunk of leavened dough that you put into another chunk of fresh dough You wait long enough and that stuff begins to rise. It gets bigger and eventually the whole lump is leaven. If you don't know about bread making, it's something that you might want to include in your future. Have a biblical experience right there in your own kitchen. Pecks of flour was all leaven. It means it starts small and then it gets bigger. Was that the point of the mustard seed parable? starts the smallest of the seeds and then it becomes so big that birds of the air are making their nest therein. Yeah, so small beginnings but really, really big endings. It's kind of like what God did with humankind. He started with a man and a woman and now we're all pu- we're pushing nine billion. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Some have said that's the only commandment mankind has ever kept. <laughs> Same thing with Noah. He starts with uh, he starts over, hits the reset button, and he's got eight people he's working with, and now we're up to, again, pushing nine billion, the only commandment that we've ever really been good at keeping. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Start small, go big, yeah? It's kind of the original go big or go home thing. Genesis chapter 12, he does the same thing with Father Abraham. Now he's starting with one guy, he's starting over again, hitting the reset button again, and he says, I'm going to make you a great nation, this one guy, and I'm going to make your name great, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You see how you start small and go big? I mean, what Jesus is doing in the parable of the, of the mustard seed is nothing different than the message of the whole Bible. God starts small and insignificant and what seems to be going nowhere and it keeps getting bigger and God keeps calling people and folks keep getting touched and the kingdom of God continues to grow. Exactly. Isaiah says it like this, I'll make you a light to the nations so my salvation might reach the ends of the earth. Malachi, at the end of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the Lord be magnified is the heart's cry of the prophet, even beyond the borders of Israel. Do you think that's happened? It's happened in our world, hasn't it? Jesus says it like this, make disciples of all ethnoi, all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And at the end of our Bible, in the book of Revelation, we get this picture of what that kingdom is going to look like at the end of time. And the seventh angel sounds and it says, the voice goes forth and it says, think in the back of your mind, Handel's Messiah, the great crescendo. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. Will you stand with me? I'm wondering, how are, how are you building the kingdom? What kingdom program how are you instituting? Is it like the Sadducees and that you're going to get it all here and now? Is it about self-assertion or is it about taking the yoke of the kingdom upon you and, and then expressing that, showing that back to God and to the world by obeying God, obeying his spirit, obeying his word. This is the way the kingdom grows, taking the yoke of the kingdom and then expressing itself as we say, not my will, but your will. I'm submitting to the rule of the great king. Submitting to the rule of the great king. Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done in my life. Do you have that kind of attitude about kingdom building? And are you, as the video challenged, are you taking part in the mission of the kingdom? Because the kingdom... It's like that piece of leaven. It's like that mustard seed that's still growing. There's more growth to happen. There's more yet to be done. There's more people to be brought into this awesome, incredible, glorious, amazing kingdom because of the glorious, awesome, amazing king who's the king of the kingdom. You ready to engage in that kind of way?
Let's pray. Father, we want to give you thanks for these incredible kingdom parables that just challenge our socks or our sandals off. And we thank you for a king who came and, and became like one of us and, and com- stooped down to communicate with us in ways that we could understand, ways that impact us, the ways that are so powerful, Lord, that it, these, these words beckon us into your presence. Lord God, we want to. We want to reject that, that kingdom building where it's all right in the here and the now. And we reject that as a kingdom building program. It's not legitimate. We realize that. We also reject the kingdom building program of self-assertion. And it's my way. It's my way or the highway. But Lord, we embrace this attitude that was taught back in the time of Jesus. We accept the yoke of the kingdom and everything that that entails, obeying the voice of your spirit, the voice of your word, conforming our lives to the life, to the character, the nature of the great king. And Lord, may your kingdom come in our lives and may it be expressed in every opportunity that we have throughout our community, throughout our family, throughout our circle, our sphere of influence, Lord God. May your kingdom be expressed in us. May your goodness shine forth through us. May a life that's submitted to the will of God, the word of God, be so clearly seen in us and be bearing so much fruit that your kingdom grows and grows and grows and grows and birds of the air make their nests therein. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen.